Awesome job! You know what I'm thinking? Snack time! <laughs> Let's go! Okay, let's see what we have here. <gasps> Which one do you want? That wasn't nice of Rachel. Where did she pick up those greedy tendencies? Taking both apples and biting into them. That's so unlike her. Dad? 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 What is it, honey? I have this one. This apple's more juicier and sweeter. Yeah, come on. We get, we've done it wrong before, right? Things aren't always as they first appear. We think it's going to be a certain way. We got this narrative. This kid, uh, this, this dad had a narrative about his kid. Like, what is going on here? Who taught you this? Clearly, it was mom that taught you to grab <laughs> both apples and eat them. <laughs> yeah, it's Father's Day once a year. Take that, moms. But, but then, of course, then he realized what she was doing, and it, like, the whole thing completely flips around. Why? Because we don't really know what we think we know. We don't really understand all that we think we understand. We have a certain very, very limited point of view, and we're basing everything we know on this incredibly limited point of view. And sometimes we're not quite accurate. It's not, it's not quite right. So that's what we're going to be talking about today in the parable we're talking about. But before we go too much further, yeah, we do want to say happy Father's Day. And matter of fact, not just that. Listen, now more than ever, this world needs a man of God, men of God. And what, what do I mean by men of God? This is a man who loves his family. This is the kind of person that you can build your life around. They're like pillars, and you can attach yourself to them because they, they have wisdom, and they work hard, and they take care of other people. They're like concrete. You can build on them. They love God. They, they go to church. They bring their family to church. Matter of fact, Heartland and everybody online, we, we're a church filled with men of God. I thank you. You guys are making a huge difference. It's one of those secret things that people don't realize how much difference it makes. It's a huge difference. So, yeah, to all the men of God, matter of fact, let's give them a hand here to all the men of God and everybody online. We are so very, very glad you're doing what you're called to do. We're not, and listen, we're not looking for perfection. A man of God is not perfect. But a man of God would even ask forgiveness. You see what I'm saying? Go to God and, and get repentant. That's what we're talking about. That's what this world needs, in my opinion, almost more than anything else. I think, I think almost every societal ill that we see right now can be, can be flipped around with, with more and more men of God like we have here today. Matter of fact, I want to do something a little, a little different here. And everybody online, uh, this would be for you too. If there is a father or father figure... It doesn't have to be biological. This could like it, like Pastor Glenn said, maybe an uncle, just somebody who's, who's that kind of person, that man of God kind of person. If they're here with you here today, if, they're, if you're watching online, they're there with you, would you just put your hand on their shoulder right now? I wanna, we're gonna pray for them together. We're gonna pray for all these men together. Just kind of put your hand on their shoulder. Hold their hand, they like that. That'd be real, real awkward. Lord, we pray for every single one of these fathers and father figures today. God, thank you for them. It's, uh, it's hard work, Lord, that doesn't get much appreciation. But Lord, thank you for what you've placed inside their life. I pray that every single gift inside them comes out. I pray that they continue to be that concrete pillar of God that they need to be for their family, for everybody around them. Lord, give them wisdom to speak into the lives of other people. Lord, Lord I pray that they uh, continue, Lord, uh, to push forward and, uh, Lord, not give up and have an encouragement in their heart today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. We are continuing in our sermon series through parables, and today's parable is, uh, is kind of a unique one, and it's uh, not one of the most famous ones, really. But when you're going through a whole series on parables, 
You're going to do some of the unique ones, but there's some cool stuff you're going to find out here today that you might not have known before. We're going to go ahead and get started in our scripture. It's in Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. There here is another story Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. Now, lots of Jesus' parables are agricultural in nature because that was his way of explaining things to them that they could grab a hold of. Like, oh, that makes sense. It, you know, so they were, they, this being an agrarian culture, he spoke a lot on their terms. But that night as the workers slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat. This is the parable of the, the wheat and the tares. The, King James uses the word tares, weeds. The, uh, among the wheat, then it slipped away, this, uh, this enemy slipped away. When the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. The farmer's workers went to him and said, sir, the field where you planted that good seed's full of weeds. Where did they come from? They were surprised because they didn't know till later. And an enemy has done this, the farmer exclaimed. Should we pull out the weeds? They asked. No, he replied. You'll uproot the wheat if you do. You ever like, if you pull out a chunk and everything comes with it. Let both grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, tie them in the bundles, and burn them, and to put the wheat in the barn. Then, leaving the crowds outside, Jesus went into the house. So he went into this house, and his disciples said, We don't understand what you're saying. Please explain the story of the weeds in the field. Jesus does. He replied, The Son of Man is the farmer. That Son of Man is the Messiah. The Messiah himself is the farmer who plants the good seed. The field is the world, and the good seed represents the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. The enemy who planted the weeds among the wheat is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. The, the, you know, in the, in, goes on with the book of Revelation, those kinds of things. Yes, the end of the world like we understand it. And the harvesters are the angels. Little theological aside, when our loved ones in Christ pass away, they do not become angels. Angels are a separate, intelligent, created being, okay? I know it's, we've got a lot of great gospel songs that kind of allude to angels, and that's, that's not theological. It's myth, mythological. They're, uh, humans and angels, actually, we're, we're greater than angels in our, in our understanding. So uh, we, we, we don't get harps. I'm sorry. You don't get a harp. Those of you that always wanted to learn how to play guitar, too bad. Okay. <laughs> Just as the weeds are sorted out and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the world. The Son of Man, the Messiah, will send his angels and they will remove his kingdom from his kingdom, everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And the angels will throw them into the, fur into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You get what he's explaining here. Then the righteous, the, the wheat, will shine like the sun in the Father's kingdom. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Okay, let's look at the main thought Jesus is really saying here. The good and bad are growing in the same field. Let both grow together until the harvest. They're both growing in the same field. The good and the bad are all growing together. So what Jesus is trying to explain here is, when you look at the world, it's... It's easy to see in a, in a world like we have today, the injustices that are, that are around us. Things are off. Humans hurting other humans, people killing people. I can't barely keep track of all the shootings that are taking place. Some horrible incident last yesterday where some guy shot randomly at a splash pad full of kids. I don't know if you saw this was on the news last night. I mean, and then he, they find him, he just runs back home and kills himself. It's horrible. It's just horrible. And it's easy to go like, where are you, God? Where are you, God? Why, why isn't something being done about this? Well, God is waiting until the end. The wheat and the tares are growing together at this time. So it does feel like, man, God, what, is there ever going to be a time where, where this is different, where things aren't, the, they're not like this anymore? Yes, there will be a time. It's just at the end and the angels do the harvest because when there's, when there's injustice in the world, it is easy to think like, God, where were you at? Well, he's going to deal with the situations. Matter of fact, his taking his time in, in this judgment kind of stuff is really his mercy. He's letting as many people repent of their sins, come to Christ, 
turn from all their darkness and turn to the light. He's, let, he's given us as many options as possible before the hammer comes down. So it's easy, though, to feel like there's injustice in the world. There is, but we got to trust the Lord. Listen, when it comes to the judgment of God, we got to trust God that he's, that he's going to do it. I don't know, just like we started in this parable uh, sermon, I don't know everything, you don't know everything, who are we to judge? I, 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 many times I've misjudged some things. That's why we trust God to be the one who's going to judge properly. You know, people even ask me some theological questions, how does God know this? How do, he knows everything, so it's just really easy to just kind of trust him. That he's a, a being that knows everything can make a proper judgment. The times when we make improper judgments, you and I, it's based on our lack of knowledge. And if you knew the whole truth, you'd be able to judge properly. So a God who's infinitely knowledgeable, omniscient, is always gonna make the right judgment. So we trust him that he's making the right judgment. That in time, it'll all work out the way he says it should work out. Okay, I wanna tell you a story about a guy named Juan Catalan. So, a few years ago, Juan was uh, accused of murdering uh, a, a young lady named Martha Puebla, and these uh, district attorneys and these detectives, they said, this is the guy who murdered this girl. He had, his, his brother was part of a gang. He had, uh, this was in LA, he had said, you know, goodbye to the gangs, totally turned his life around, wasn't doing any of that kind of stuff. But they had said, this is the guy, we just know this is the guy, out of revenge, that killed this Martha Puebla. So he goes to his def defense attorney and says, listen, I did not kill this woman. I did not do any of this stuff. And so the detectives come and they say, listen, where were you? And it was about 90 days before this. Now, I don't know about you, the older I get, where was I 90 days ago? Where were you March 17th? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. He, he, he couldn't remember. And they said, well, see, you couldn't remember because you're guilty. He finally did because he saw the ticket. He finally remembered that he was at an L.A. Dodgers, like he's got the shirt on. He's at an L.A. Dodgers baseball game with his seven-year-old daughter. His wife reminded him. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. And he was like, well, maybe there's some camera footage from the, from the game that was that, that would find him. So they were, uh, the defense team was searching through all the camera footage, couldn't find, uh, couldn't find him. And then he remembered there was a TV show being filmed at Dodger Stadium that day. And he's like, do you remember what show it was? He did remember. He said, yeah, it was Curb Your Enthusiasm with Larry David. So he's like, okay, Larry, those guys said, we, he, they handed over all the rough footage and they found a time when Juan and his daughter walked right in front of the camera proving that he did not murder uh, Martha Puebla. Well, I mean, it, it's horrible that she was murdered, by the way. I want to downplay that. I hope they do find the real killer. But the detectives even said, no, no, that's not enough. He could have left the game early and, uh, you know, here's the time stamp of this, and then run over there. And, well, they also found a cell phone record where he called his wife, which is what uh, we're supposed to do, right? I'm leaving the stadium. He called his wife, and it would have been like eight minutes late. It's impossible, you know, the timing for that to have worked out. But all these people had completely believed that Juan Catalan had murdered Martha Puebla. It was going to happen. He was this close to life in prison for something he did not do. Why? Because he didn't have all the information. And once we have all the information, you can make a right judgment. Why is Jesus so, why is he so uh, uh, important, why is he so emphasizing the need to judge properly? Because we just don't have all the information, guys. And we walk through our lives making judgments all the time, and we will, we'll continue to do so. But I think we need to put into our hearts today that we may need to take a step back from the judgmental stuff because we do not know all that we think we know. See, what's the difference between wheat and bearded darnels? Well, that's not a question you thought you needed to have answered today. But I'll answer it like you asked. <laughs> wheat and bearded darnels. When Jesus did this parable of the, the wheats and the tares, he was nearly certainly talking about the bearded darnel. You can see in the picture, I can't really tell the difference. Matter of fact, I think this is wheat. I think this is bearded darnels. I myself made this slide, and I can't remember which one it is. It could be backwards. That's the point, though, really, isn't it? 
So even as these plants were growing, it, you couldn't really tell which one was which. They looked pretty much the same until those, those farmers went out there. I guess at the end, when it starts getting towards the harvest, you could tell. The problem is wheat can be the, the seeds taken, of course, crushed, right? You make flour and bread and all kinds of stuff out of the wheat. The bearded darnel makes nothing. Zero zilts, not a single positive thing could come out of the bearded darnel. And you don't know it till the end. You don't know it right away. So that person in this parable it was the devil. When he sowed those seeds, you know, it didn't really come about. It couldn't really be uh, obvious until the very end. And that's once again a story about judging. Because there are some people, and they look like, I mean, this, surely this guy's a follower of God. Surely this lady knows the Lord. How do we know? Or there's somebody else like, boy, you, that person's far from God. They got tattoos. Right? I mean, I'd have, like, long hair if I had hair. I don't even got a choice. God did this. God did this. Take this up with the Lord. You have to stare at it every Sunday. Sorry. So that's not, those are things that humans and, and sadly many Christians, we base our, our understanding on this person's a righteous person by the way they look or the way they dress or the way they talk. God doesn't base it on any of those outside things. Those things don't matter to him one bit. What matters is the heart and the inner things. God is looking upon the heart. And how many times we just kind of judge somebody like, oh, that, that person's a good person. This person's a not good person. This person's a, uh, got, a, got the right heart. This person doesn't. We don't know. Matter of fact, you only find out, just like this po po parable, you only find out towards the end when you start to see the, the fruit, the, the organic reproduction of what's coming out of their heart is actually when you start to find out who's really who. So that's why, since we don't have all the information, we should dial it back a little bit with all the judging stuff because we're, we're going to get it wrong and it gets really embarrassing. We've all been there, right? We've all done that kind of stuff, right? You, you say, oh, this is how it's going to be. This is how it goes. And they're like, um, no. One time there was a lady and she was, it was, uh, it was another town, let me say it that way, another town where there's a Heartland Church. And she was uh, <laughs> going around town saying, this Heath is cheating on his wife with this young girl. Well, it find out that's my wife. She's only two years younger than me, thank you very much. <laughs> it, it was like, and then she ended up coming to our church later when she realized the mistake. But there's a little prejudge and she should have backed off a little bit, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna throw it out there. Like, yes, I am not that much older than Misty is. So she both loves and hates that story. <laughs> like, like, oh, anyway. But we've all done that, right? Where we say something, they're like, no, I'm sorry, uh, that's not how this works. Well, uh, why? Because we prejudge, we went into a situation and we, we got it wrong. That's why we need to back it back a little bit, dial it back a little bit, and let the Holy Spirit do what he does best instead of doing what, us doing what we do. All right, another story. This is Michael Talatas, born in 1856, Died in, what is it, 1938. Uh, you might have seen this story. It's going around online kind of uh, catching, uh, you know, the internet. And here, Michael Talatas, his, when he was born, he was born to a woman that, his mother, that, um, that he, she didn't say who her father, who the father was. This was many years ago. And so this woman didn't have really almost any family. When Michael was born, uh, there's many complications to the, the birth, and his mother died almost right after, within four hours of the birth of Michael, um, his mother died. And now there's nobody, literally nobody came to claim this little, this little baby. So there was some uh, monks that lived, this is Mount Athos, some monks that lived in this, uh, say monkery, monastery is the word I'm looking for. They lived in the monkery. <laughs> That's the... That's the official Christian word for it. They lived in the monastery, and they took, they took little uh, Michael, as, and they raised him. When he was old enough, 
Now, by the way, this, these monks, they're, they're totally secluded. There's not a woman allowed on Mount Athos, never has been, not a woman. It's just the guys, they never leave that place. Once you're a monk in that place, you never, you don't go buy supplies anywhere. You stay right there and people bring stuff. It's just a really kind of secluded environment. So Michael was raised in a secluded environment. When he got old enough, they asked him, do you want to be a monk? He says, yes. He died at the age of, I think, what is it, 82, never having left that mountain, and never having, they think he's the only man in history that has never set eyes on a woman. He saw zero women in his life. That's well, sad, isn't it? Okay, what's my point of this story? Like, okay, that's sad. This poor guy. He does look like he needs some fashion help, by the way. So I think a woman would have done him better, but I just, just saying. That there's a certain part of Christianity that, that embraces a kind of a secluded style of living. Notice the wheats and the tares grew up together. They did not grow up secluded. And it's easy for us to be like, look, I don't want any temptation, so I'm going to go live on a little mountain where there's never a woman so I can never be tempted. I'm going to just stay away from everything. That's actually not the approach that, uh, that God wants us to, to have. We're supposed to be in the world, not of the world. So what did Jesus, Jesus is our example. He sat down with sinners. He had dinner with them, but he just didn't sin with them. So that's really the model that we need, not this kind of uh, monk stuff and secluded stuff and that feels righteous. That's really not righteous. Actually, it's better to be around other environments and just saying, no, nope, that's not how I want to live. No, nope, I want to speak life into those situations. Does that make sense? When we go, when we go about this judging stuff, it's real easy. The path of that, that judging stuff sometimes leads to this kind of seclusive stuff. And it's important that we realize the, the wheats and the tares, they, they grow together. So what do we do about this? We do this. We focus on our own hearts. It's, it's, it's easy to make other people's sin a, a topic of conversation. Just this week. I had two different, I don't know how to say, I'm kind of mega church pastor, famous pastor type guys in America. And two of my probably top 10 just had two different situations that finally this situation came out and here it is, they did this or they did that. And it hurts. And here we are preparing for this message and I'm like, because it makes, it makes it harder to do what I do. Because they're like, well, what you got hiding in there, Heath? Huh? Skeletons? dates it in the closet and 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 if we don't deal with it properly right now i'm not saying everybody needs to be perfect but these things just weren't dealt with properly and 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 so i found myself kind of obsessing on these other men and their sin instead of just going whoa 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 whoa, whoa time out let's look right here make sure i got my own heart right because i'll tell you it will take our lifetime for us to keep our hearts focused on god uh, you won't, we won't, we, if we do this right, we really don't have much time left to be uh, aggressively thinking about other people's sin. But here's why it feels so good to think about other people's sin, because when, when we spotlight on their sin, it's not on us. It makes us kind of feel like, oh, especially if they do something worse than us. Mm, I love that. I pray you all do things much worse than me, because then I'm like, look at all you people. But if we stop and realize I'm still in need of a savior, I got situations I got to uh, hand over to Jesus yet. We're still peeling back layers of onion on this guy, on my heart, on your heart. You see what I'm saying? We got plenty of layers to peel back that God wants to deal with. Let's just focus on that and not focus on everybody else and all their situations and what they're doing or what they're not doing and, and all that kind of stuff. It's so tempting. Don't go down that road. Particularly here at Heartland Church, we have churches in small towns where everybody knows the stuff. Everybody knows the stuff. No, let's not go down that road, guys. So focus on our own hearts, staying right with God. And that leads us to how we apply this. Two things. Catch those moments when you start to prejudge someone and focus on your own heart. First, just start right here. Catch those moments. The Holy Spirit's going to lead you, and the Holy Spirit's going to guide you, and he's going to be like, oh, that's what we're talking about right there. Can you believe? It starts off like something like that. Can you, when you're about to say, can you believe, comma, whatever's coming after that, 
made the Holy Spirit go, ho, 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 ho. Watch out. Because we don't have all the information, guys. And we can start down that path of just, and we're just like, oh, yeah, that's, we're going to judge this. We're going to judge that. Time out. We don't have all. How do we know? How do we know? Do we know all the things? No, we don't. So let's just back it off a little bit and let the Holy Spirit speak to us about this prejudgment and when this happens in our, in our hearts. Because I think before you know it, you're going to find that the Holy Spirit's like, no, 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 let's, let's just work on this right here. Let's work on right here. You got plenty to work on right here. How about that time when you treated so-and-so poorly? How about the time you said those things? You, were, you, you lashed out in anger. You get what I'm saying? But let the Holy Spirit speak to us. And the second one's just focus on your own heart. Plenty to do right here, guys. Plenty to do right here. No, the internet's a wild, it's like the wild west. And there's so many opportunities, whole people with YouTube pages. Like the whole point is to nitpick other ministries and other things. Even I will put out, our church will put out little reels of our messages here and there, little like 90, it's not even 90 second, 55 second videos. And, and it's always weird when I see somebody on our YouTube page, it's always somebody like, I don't even know who it is, somebody random from the world. And they're like, that's not true, such and such. Okay, I, I preach for like 35 minutes on average. I may, in 55 seconds, something can easily be taken out of context. If you don't listen to the rest of the 34 minutes and five seconds. But that's, that's how it is. Now, I am kind of excited because the people that comment on those and kind of jab me a little bit online, those numbers, our view numbers always go way up. So uh, feel free to troll me all you want. <laughs> Instead of 400 views, I get like 3,000 views. Like, bring it on. But there's whole YouTube pages. It's just geared towards finding it because it feels so good. But was it the heart of Jesus or was it the heart of the Pharisee that tore into every little nitpick thing is that which which one of those was it jesus that tore into every little part or was it the heart of the pharisee we got to make sure we don't have any heart of the pharisee the tearing other people down instead of dealing with what's inside of our own hearts amen if i could have every heart head bowed and every heart uh, eye closed please and hearts open this is all the work of the holy spirit in us guys it's not the work of a man. I'm not telling you to change. I'm telling you, let the Holy Spirit come in and begin to illuminate the times when we do this kind of stuff. This is very easy. It's very easy. <laughs> so I was prepping for this same message at this sermon. I mean, I caught myself so many times I had, it just was coming out of me naturally. It's just very dangerous. So let's pray together here. I'm just going to pray for you. Just open your heart right now. Everybody online with us too. Lord, we don't want to, we don't want to have that Pharisee spirit. We want to be the wheat, not the tare. Lord, you're letting it all grow together. And we trust you that you will take care of it when the time needs to be taken care of. But Lord, we don't want to be any ounce, any spirit, any touch of that judgmentalism. We want to leave that all up to you, Lord. Because you know which one's a wheat and which one's a tear. We don't know. You know who's righteous and unrighteous. We leave this completely up to you, Jesus. I pray, Lord, that we free up parts of our mind and heart <laughs> that are being occupied with this distractions of other people's sin. We free that up for us to grow into the persons you've called us to be. Lord, help us to be uh, f fulfilled in the identity you call us to be. And uh, Lord, I pray right now that, that each of us be who you called us to be, Lord, because we know if, if we're who you called us to be, that's what's best for everybody around us. That's what's best for, my, for our kids or our grandkids or our spouse. Lord, help us to be who you called us to be, filled with your righteousness, filled with the fruit of the Spirit loving and caring for other people. Help us to be those believers. In Jesus' name, amen.